good evening everybody thank you for joining me this evening thank you to ishan sharma thank you to the great student-led initiative karwan heritage initiative uh, i think for almost two months now karwan has been bringing us so many amazing uh, informative discussions almost maybe even more than one a day sometimes um, for those who already joined me on the 15th of May last month, this is exactly the same uh, talk as that one. So um, it may not necessarily be of great interest to you because we need to do it again. I was not able to tape it the first time. Um, so my name is Ira Mukoti and I'm here to speak to you about my previous book, Daughters of the Sun. Um, in this, I've spoken about the women of the great Mughals, so approximately six great Mughals from the time of Babur, 1526, to Aurangzeb, 1707. So during the span of this time, what were the women like? Uh, what was their influence like? Um, in what ways were they able to wield that influence? These are the, some of the questions that interested me and that I hope to have brought across in my book. Now, when I first started thinking about, uh, you know, Mughal women, women of the harem some years ago, um, in my mind, I had an image more or less like the one you see here, the Oriental harem, which is really a colonial uh, construct. It was when the, the Europeans came here from the 16th century onwards, 17th and 18th century. And they wrote about the great Mughal empire that they saw. They wrote about the Mughal court and they wrote about what they imagined the harem to be. They, of course, as foreign men, had no access to these women, and they were separated from them through culture, through language, through physical barriers. But that didn't stop them from imagining what it must have been like. And so they wrote a number of very um, outrageous and uh, you know, explicit sort of uh, memoirs and uh, writings at that time. Uh, and they more or less followed the same genre of uh, women who were degraded and kept in isolation, kept within the zanana, and uh, spent their time basically trying to beautify themselves and attract the attention of a single man, the Pacha. So for the, for the Europeans who wrote at that time, they didn't see much difference between the Mughal court, the Safavid court, and the Ottoman court. For them, this was all one big mess of uh, Muslim or Moorish influence. And because of uh, the Europeans' own past, their violent past with, uh, with Islam, uh, they tended to, th to write about it and think about it in, in a sort of bina binary way, you know? Uh, so, so the men were a certain way and the women were a certain way, and that was the way it was presented to us. And because these writings were very accessible to us in English, um, a, a lot of us sort of uh, subliminally um, thought of uh, the Mughals and the court and the Zanana in this particular low way. Now, even if you looked a little more carefully and uh, later on the writings got more textured and more nuanced, we learned more about these women, what their lives were like. And yet somehow in a certain way, these women remained static in time, you know, so whether it was the earlier women from the time of Babur and Humayu, or later on, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb, these women were all, they all seemed to remain unchanged. The Zanana seemed to stay in the static, immobile sort of space. So they may have been more cultured. We learned about the jewelry they wore, about the food they ate, um, you know, and the sort of activities that they were involved in. But there was somehow no um, no change in the in the way in which they behaved, the way in which they were able to exercise influence, the, the even the activities that they were able to carry out. You know, there was not a, a, a sort of dynamic way in which they were presented. And so I thought it may be useful um, to look at this more closely. And this brought me to um, to my book. So there are certain issues, you know, when you uh, when we start writing about it, start thinking about it. There are a, a number of writings which which do sort of propagate this idea that we had. So in the, in the first three uh, sections, the European travelers, I have touched upon a little bit with you to to tell you the way the scandalous recordings of these European travelers. Then we had many mi Jesuit missionaries who were in India at that time. And because they had a certain agenda um, uh, to try and proselytize, try and convert, uh, sometimes even the Pacha and his, uh, you know, some of his uh, courtiers, uh, they had a certain agenda as well. And so they spoke about the harem with a certain preconception. So that is something to keep in mind as well. 
Now, the Indian biographers, the men, the, the ones who, who wrote in Persian and gave us these recordings, they had a certain point of view which may have been diametrically opposed in the sense that they wrote about the women as inordinately chaste, you know, women who were beyond even imagining. You did not even have the right to utter their names. So they were ha hidden behind, you know, grandiose titles. So Maryam Uzzamani, Maryam Makani, these were all titles given basically to hide their own names, the names which may give away certain details about the women. They were meant to be really beyond uh, common mortals imagining. So that in another way, again, made them invisible to us. So uh, what sources can we use? There are other sources, of course, and I will be talking about the next one, Gulbadan's Humayunama, in a little more detail. Uh, there are other sources as well, which I have used, such as the Rajput recordings and the Jain sources. Uh, amongst others. Market gossip is also an interesting one. Now, it is often, again, all, uh, rather scandalous in nature, uh, but sometimes there is a little uh, grist of truth in it, you know, so we must understand where, the, where this gossip also came from, popular myths, what is behind all the popular myths what was uh, trying to be achieved by these myths. So these are interesting things to think about. And then you have architecture. Now, architecture, you know, remains unchanged in a certain way for centuries. So that is a very useful uh, source to use to back up certain theories you may have. And finally, Mughal painting, which I have used, I think, extensively. I have really enjoyed uh, using them, writing about them. And in Mughal paintings, you see details which are never mentioned in the writing. So also another very useful source. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about Gulbadan's memoirs because uh, the writing of Gulbadan's uh, memoirs was so instrumental for my book. Uh, and also, it is an example of how easy it is to forget about women's writings. Um, now, Akbar, when he was getting his own biography written in the 1580s and early 1590s, uh, of course, it was Abu al Fazl who was entrusted with this task, you know, his great biographer and friend. But Akbar also asked a few other people to write about their own personal memoirs of Babur and Humayun. And one of the persons he asked was his aunt Gulbadan. Now, Gulbadan was Babur's daughter, Humayun's sister, and therefore Akbar's aunt. And so she had a direct first person uh, experience of these men, of the Zenana at the time of these men. And so she was able to give a unique view, you know, of that, that world, the harem, from within the harem. Um, and it is really a unique document. Um, and yet, after Gulbadan wrote uh, her, uh, her Humayun Nama in the 1580s, it, ten it tended to become uh, completely forgotten. Uh, later biographers did not refer to it. They did not say, OK, Gulbadan Begum said this in her biography. Uh, and therefore, you know, it sort of got lost to us and completely forgotten from our memory for hundreds of years. And then in the 19th century, during the British Raj, uh, a, a British man was traveling in India and buying up manuscripts. Uh, and he bought a whole load of manuscripts. And then he died, uh, and it, I think in around 18 in the 1860s, and his widow needed to raise some money. And so she sold a thousand of these manuscripts to the British Library. And they remained in the British Library for decades. Then early in the 20th century, Annette Beveridge translated these documents and including this particular one, translated it into English and found that this was Gulbadan Begum's memoirs. And this extraordinary document then became available to us in English. And yet, many, many biographers and, and historians tended to relegate it to the margins of historiography. You know, we did not really understand its full significance. Still, really, Ruby Lal, an academic and feminist historian, wrote a book based on this uh, on this memoir and explained its significance to us. You know, uh, domesticity and power in the early Mughal world. And it was when I stumbled across this work that uh, you know it was a sort of epiphany for me because I realized I did have a document. Things were not, uh, you know, so uh, desperate as they may have seen. There was an account from within the harem telling us, giving us the voices of these women. So I wanted to give this to you as an example to show you how fragile uh, our women's voices sometimes, how easy it is to relegate them to the margins, how easy to obliterate them altogether. Now, uh, to, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm taking you to this um, miniature painted in, in around 1404, um, which was when a Spanish ambassador called Rui Gonzalez de Clavio was at Timur's court. And he wrote back an extraordinary account of his stay at Timur, at Timur's court. Um, and now Timur was um, 
the found in the way uh, he's the founder, not not the founder, but uh, the, the Babur was a direct descendant of Tim, of Timur, and the the Mughals claimed this ancestry in a very powerful way. Uh, and the things that uh, the the Spanish ambassador Ray Gonzalez wrote about in this court tell us something about what the Mughals would be later on, in you know. In, through the centuries. And he writes about a court in which uh, culture is greatly valued. He writes about a court in which Islam is only one of the newest symbols. There are many other symbols which Timur claims, you know, as part of his sovereignty. So Islam, uh, they're not so strongly wedded to the concept of Islam as some of the other, uh, you know, Muslim monarchies. Timur is, uh, needs to be pragmatic because there are many different sort of peoples living under him, you know, and the memory of Genghis Khan's Yasa laws are still very much relevant. So Timur understands the need to be pragmatic and use a number of different symbols uh, to rule his empire. And this is something that we will see later on in the Mughals as well. Uh, another thing to remember is that uh, these were uh, semi-nomadic people, peripatetic, they were constantly traveling and the women were traveling with them. Therefore, there was no idea of a settled cloistered space, uh, the space in which the Europeans uh, you know, think of the, of the Mughal harem. This was not true at all. The women traveled with their men because there was not one city in which they were confined to. Uh, the tent was really their living condition and they traveled in tents and on horses and camelbacks everywhere with their men. So there was no uh, extremely opaque, uh, you know, veiling of these women that happened. Even this ambassador said that he could see the women's faces very clearly. They wore just a very light diaphanous cloth in front of them. Um, so these traits uh, of the Timurids, uh, including the women's, um, you know, mobility, the way that they accompanied the men and participated because the Spanish ambassador wrote about how they participated in the banquets and they were drinking along with the men. So this participation, uh, you know, in the visibility of empire was something that we would see again with the Mughals later on. So I have divided my book, Daughters of the Sun, uh, broadly in three categories because I found that the sort of influence and the sort of women we were talking about went through three broad stages, you know, in the sort of uh, influence they were able to exercise. So in the first part, we find that the matriarchs of the Mughals were extremely powerful, you know, the mothers, the aunts, the elder sisters, for example. And one of the uh, miniatures in which we can, uh, which attests to this, is this uh, very early painting from about 1545 in Kabul, when Humayu and uh, his wife Hamida Banu have come back from their two-year exile in Persia. And uh, the child Akbar was left behind uh, in the care of his milk mothers. Um, and Humayun wants to see if the child will recognize his mother after an absence of two years. And so uh, Akbar is brought in front of all these women. And of course, happily, he recognizes his mother and goes running to her and sits in her lap. And so this is what is depicted in this, in this miniature. And so this woman, Hamida Banu Begum, uh, is an extremely influential, powerful woman. We hear about her already through Gulbadan's Humayun Nama, because Gulbadan writes about these two years that Ham Hamida Banu spends in Persia with her husband. She writes about the manner in which Humayun met his wife, his courtship of her, the way in which Huma, uh, Hamida Banu was not terribly impressed by this slightly bedraggled man who claimed he was emperor of Hindustan but who had hardly any followers. Um, so Gulbadan gives us a very intimate uh, picture of Hamida Banu which no other biographer does. The other women sitting to the left of Hamida Banu and Akbar uh, could be Bega Begum who was Humayun's first wife. Uh, and who had been captured during a battle and returned at around this time. So this is possibly her. It is possibly also next to her, Gulbadan herself sitting uh, next to Bega Begum. To the right, we have the women who are a little uh, more informally dressed um, uh, with just the long robes and the high cap. And these are probably the milk mothers of Akbar. Because when Akbar was left behind as a toddler of one year old, he was left in the care of these milk mothers and they guarded him, it is said, with their own lives. They put their lives, you know, in front of the child once when uh, he was in danger. And they looked after him, you know, with great dedication, which explains somewhat their great influence later on in Akbar's life. And through his long, you know, life and career, some of this, these women, such as Gigi Anga, would remain right till the end of his career. And this explains why he had so much trust in them, you know, because they had uh, literally guarded over his life. So this is a very important uh, miniature to understand these various influences of the, these early uh, matriarchs. So coming back to a very uh, 
little known but influential matriarch is Khamzada Begum, who was Babur's eldest sister, elder to him by five years. And at a very critical time of Babur's life, you know, when he was uh, long before he established uh, his empire in Hindustan, he was still trying to hang on to Samarkand and Fergana and his hometowns, his homelands. Uh, but there was a very powerful opponent, Shebani Khan Uzbeks. The Uzbeks at that time, their star was rising. And so Babur had to, had to flee from them. And at one point, he was besieged by Shebani Khan Khan Uzbek and Shibani Khan and uh, you know Babur and his followers were, were driven at this time to eating horses and dogs and the situation was desperate and at this time Shibani Khan Uzbek wrote a letter to Babur and said if you leave your sister Khanzada Begum with me then I will allow you and your entourage to escape and that is what Babur does and Khanzada Begum remains basically um, you know um, uh, in the care of Shebani Khan Uzbek, who first marries her uh, and then gets fed up of her because she keeps talking about her uh, brother's family and her own great family. So he gets fed up and gives her to another man to marry. Uh, and he keeps her for about 10 years until he himself is, is defeated by the Shah of Persia and sent back to Babur. And Babur greets her and receives her with a great deal of respect and homage. And this is the moment which is being depicted in this uh, miniature, which is the return of Khanzada Begum. And you can see uh, uh, in this miniature that uh, the figure of Khanzada Begum herself in yellow is almost bigger than all the other figures. And you know this shows us uh, the great respect that she had and the great respect that she commanded. Babur is sitting quite humbly in front of her, listening to her while she gestures and explains something. So the person of Khanzada Begum is again brought out by Gulbadan, who tells her, tells us that she had a very important role when she came back to Hindustan. When uh, when Humayun was trying to reclaim his throne, he used Khanzada Begum as an ambassador uh, when his own brothers were trying to revolt against him. Now, they would not listen to anybody else. They wouldn't listen to any other great warrior or any other uh, ambassador. But this elderly lady, by that time she was elderly, this elderly, elderly lady ha held still so much moral authority in the name of Babur that he sent, he decided to send her alone in, through such a dangerous voyage to try and accomplish this crucial task. So we see through Gulbadan's account how uh, you know, how very respected uh, Khanzada was and, and how much influence she had, despite being, uh, you know, by then she had no husband, she had no sons, but in her own self, she commanded this respect. So this was very interesting to me that, you know, no shame was attached to her, despite the fact that she had been twice married to enemy men. She had been widowed, uh, and yet they, they did not attach any stigma at all. So the, the Mughals were very pragmatic in this sense, going back to the Timurid heritage. They knew that in times of war, women were often, you know, a sad, uh, you know, consequence of some of the, the great, uh, you know, uh, evils that had to happen to them, but they never blamed the women themselves uh, for, for these things, for, for the fact that they were sometimes married to the enemy, for the fact that they were sometimes divorced and sometimes widowed. And they accepted, uh, accepted them back with open hearts and, and with great respect. So this figure remains of great importance. Now, another miniature which brings us to an important moment in Mughal history, which brings us, which also again shows us, uh, you know, the power and the presence of these matriarchs, of these women, is, is this particular one uh, painted around 1546. And I believe it is now thought to be the earliest recorded painting. Uh, it has been greatly studied by uh, art historians, especially Laura Parodi, amongst others. And they have done a great deal of work analyzing, uh, you know, the clothes the people are wearing, their expressions the gifts which have been given to them, uh, even the rock structures and the trees have been identified to a particular place outside Kabul. And so they have done a great deal of work to bring to light certain facts to us. Now, initially, uh, this uh, miniature was called Humayu and his brothers in a garden setting. Uh, because as you can see on the bottom, there's in the central figure in the bottom, that's Humayu. And possibly across him is uh, his brother Hindal. But the other two are, are probably not his brothers. And yet it is assumed that it must be Humayu, therefore it must be his brothers, you know, in the usual male-centric way in which these things are inter interpreted. But in fact, Laura Parodi and others have found that if we look carefully, then there are two groups of women. And if we zoom in and look at these in particular, on the left hand side, this grouping of women, they have looked carefully at the clothes they're wearing, at the jewelry they're wearing, at the flowers that are being offered to the woman in green. And these scholars have um, 
suggested that that woman, in fact, is Hamida Banu Begum. The woman standing in, in white is possibly Gulbadan Begum. The one next to her is Gulchira Begum, possibly. Why? Because these are Timurid women. So these women are particularly respected for their Timurid blood, for being daughters um, of Babur, you see. And the other woman sitting next to them is perhaps Bega Begum. So this grouping of women shows us uh, that actually it is not just Humayun and his brothers who are being celebrated here, it is this group of women. To the right, we have what looks like uh, the milk mothers, perhaps even Mahamanga herself. Uh, both of them, both of those women, the milk mothers, standing almost in a guarding position over a small child who appears to be Akbar. So this shows us that actually this painting isn't about Humayun and his brothers at all. It is about these women. It is about something which is very important in their lives that is happening at, the, at this moment. And it, has, it is believed to be, in fact, a, a, a ritual around the circumcision ceremony of Akbar, which was a very important ritual in the life of a prince. And if we, uh, if we look back at this painting where, where, uh, Mahamang, where the milk mothers are depicted, if you look closely at the yellow uh, structure, the, the stone and the cave structure, structure behind, you will see that it is it actually depicts the shape of an elephant. Uh, and if we go back to the original painting, if you look at that area in the top right corner, you can see that it is an elephant, you know, in blue, in, in blue rocks. Uh, now, the significance of that blue rock is that um, Hamina Banu Begum is said to be related to a certain 12th century Sufi sheikh uh, called Ahmed of Jam, who was also known as the colossal elephant. So the symbol of the elephant is believed to link Hamida to that symbol of the Sufi sheikh. And it is important because Humayu had a dream, even before he met Hamida, of this sheikh coming to him and promising him a son called Akbar. So for these uh, Mughals, for these early Mughals, the symbol of the elephant of Hamida Banu being related to this Sufi Sheikh is extremely important. And scholars believe that this is what is being celebrated in this painting. So indeed, it is the lineage of Hamida Banu Begum, which is being glorified and, and, and celebrated through these fertility rites, which are happening around the circumcision of Akbar. Another interesting thing is that when uh, Hamida Banu was traveling in Persia with her husband, with Humayu, for two years, one of the monuments they visited because they went uh, on a long journey together and visited all the important monuments of Persia of that area, one of the monuments is, in fact, the mausole mausoleum of Sheikh Ahmed of Jam because Hamida was interested in visiting the mausoleum of her ancestor. Now, another woman that I can bring up, uh, you know, as a part of the matriarchs of this time is Bega Begum. We have just uh, mentioned her in passing. She was, in fact, Humayu's first wife. Um, and her children did not survive. The daughter was killed at a, during a battle. Um, and when she returned, uh, you know, to Hindustan after Humayu's death, she was a widow with no children, no son, no husband anymore. And instead of going on to Agra uh, and later on Fatehpur Sikri uh, with the Mughal harem, she decided to stay on in Delhi, which was the place from which Humayu had reigned for a short time. And, uh, uh, and uh, Bega Begum uh, stayed here for a while on her own and then went and performed the Hajj. So when she came back, she was called Haji Begum. So sometimes there's a confusion about who Haji Begum is, and she is Bega Begum. Um, she came back and brought in her train many uh, artisans and uh, scholars to pray for uh, for Humayu. And it is believed that the, the, this great Humayu's tomb was probably begun before Bega Begum left. And when she came back, she brought back all these scholars. She built the Arab Sarai and she remained uh, at this site, uh, you know, um, giving largesse, looking after 500 indigent women uh, through her own uh, money and, and basically looking after uh, Humayu's tomb and guarding it, you know, uh, holding vigil over the memory of the emperor for the rest of her life. And she only occasionally comes to the Mughal court at great occasions, like for the birth of her son or to celebrate uh, Akbar's great, great uh, Gujarat victories, for example. But the rest of the time, she remains at the site of Humayu's tomb. Now, another woman of this time we have talked about is Hamida Banu, but she wasn't just, uh, you know, important at that time as an uh, as a young woman when traveling with uh, with Humayun. When she came back to Hindustan, she was a great collector of books, and this book on the left, uh, which is. Um, a Persian version of the Ramayan was her own personal copy. And if you look at the right, uh, in the upper 
in the upper half of it, if you can see my cursor here, uh, this lobed petal shaped uh, seal is Hamida Banu's personal seal. And we have found it, uh, scholars have found it on many books. You know, So she had dozens of personal copies of all these interesting books. Uh, she was so not, not only a scholar and interested in, in learning, um, but she was very uh, influential uh, in, a, in a number of ways. For example, whenever Akbar went through some, uh, you know, very uh, tormented moments of his life, like in 1577, when he went through an epiphany and was even considering giving up kingship, he was so moved and shaken by this episode. It's Hamida Banu who is brought to him and who stays with him and who convinces him to come back to court. So uh, at another time, when a few years later, when Birbal dies, uh, and again, Akbar is completely, uh, you know, distraught and he uh, refuses to go to the Charoka Darshan. He refuses to attend to work. He refuses to eat and drink. Once again, it is Hamita Banu who comes to him and consoles him. So the influence of this woman is really extraordinary. Uh, another thing she was um, influential in and that we don't, uh, you know, we tend not to remember too much is in the building and patronage of uh, temples and priests of Mathura. Uh, there are written farmans which, in which she uh, reaffirms Akbar's orders that these priests and their cows must be protected and no one must harass them. So it shows us an important way in which these matriarchs were important in the sense that when Akbar gave an order, sometimes they were not followed through. And so the people, uh, the priests and you know, the people concerned would approach the women of the Mughal harem and again petition them. And the women would reinforce one more time what Akbar had said. Um, so in these various ways on their own, you know, when we look at one writing or one firman, it, it can amount to what seems like not a great deal. But when we put them together, we see the consistent influence of these women throughout their lives in different ways. Uh, and Akbar was always very loath you know, to sort of oppose these women openly. So when he had to do something which he knew would displease them, uh, for example, when he was acting against the ulema um, whom the women supported, then he had to make sure that they were traveling and out of the city at that time to be able to do what he wanted. Um, because otherwise he knew he would face a lot of opposition from the women. Now, Gulbuddin herself, we have spoken about, and we know how important her Humayun Nama is to us. But she also did another extraordinary thing. Uh, she was quite an adventurous and feisty woman. Uh, and uh, in the 1570s, uh, around 1575, I think, she and uh, uh, a number of women from the Mughal harem went to uh, do the, the Mughal Hajj. Now, this was a very dangerous thing at that time. Uh, the Portuguese were greatly opposed to trade in that area. So they used to sometimes capture the, uh, the ships which were going on the Hajj. They would harass the occupants. And Akbar was very concerned about this, you know. Uh, so by the time Gulbadan reached Surat, Akbar heard that the Portuguese were being particularly troublesome at that time. And they were likely to trouble Gulbadan and her sisters from the harem if they went on this Hajj. So he asked his uh, aunt to please come back and to consider this journey in itself up to Surat, to consider it a Hajj and to come back to court. But Gulbadan, in typical, uh, you know, independent manner, uh, refused to listen to the Pacha and, you know, decided that she had not come so far to now be turned away. And she went on with her, with all those ladies to carry out this Hajj. And it took them seven years door to door before they were back in Fatehpur Sikri. And, uh, you know, they went through many adventures and they did all the Hajj, major and minor, we are told. They gave, they distributed so much money that it became something of an embarrassment for the authorities who asked them to please return quickly to Hindustan because they were creating crowds and all sorts of, uh, you know, um, uh, problems in the city, in the holy city because of the crowding due to the money they were distributing. Now, I was not able to get a direct account of Gulbadan, uh, Gulbadan's Hajj journey. So I used something called the Anis al-Hijaj, which is a later account uh, written during the time of Aurangzeb, sponsored by one of his daughters. Another recording of going to the Hajj and the sort of activities that people went through. So on the left, you can see that lady in the middle. Uh, she's sitting surrounded by other Hajjis, other men and women. And the women were not supposed to be veiled in the holy city. So uh, you know, this is what uh, Gulbadan must have gone through. On the right, you can see them preparing themselves uh, you know, to, to carry out the, the, the rites. Of, uh, of the Hajj. So uh, I was able to use the many beautiful drawings which accompany the Anis al-Hijaj to get an idea of what Gulbadan, uh, what she must have gone through when she was carrying out this long, perilous journey. 
Now, this other group of women, the milk mothers, I will just touch upon them. You know, I don't have the time to go <clears throat> very in depth with them. Uh, but in fact, one of the first structures I came across when doing um, a heritage walk in Delhi uh, with Asif Khan Dehilvi, in fact, and we came across this uh, amazing mosque uh, and madrasa complex. And it turns out that it is it was built by Mahamanga. It is one of the first structures of the Mughals, and it is built in a very important place, you know, a, a across from Din Pana, not far from Nizamuddin Aulia's tomb. And uh, and on it, she has this uh, writing which says that you know she writes her name and says in the time of Pacha Akbar, built by Mahamanga. Uh, so I found this fascinating that, you know, she wanted to leave her name on this building for posterity as a sign of the great power she had. And we know that she commanded power almost like a ruler in the two years until Akbar took charge. Uh, and here in the, this is corroborated by this uh, painting on the right in which we see a Mahamanga in the yellow sitting right next to the young uh, uh, Pacha Akbar. So we see how close she was to him, both physically, you know, and emotionally. He counted very much on her loyalty. Um, and she was an extremely powerful woman. Now, what happens in the second phase is that these, uh, you know, the matriarchs still remain influential as long as they live. But we come to the wives of the emperors, uh, especially Emperor Akbar. Now, I, I have a new book which is just out today, actually, which is called Akbar, the Great Mughal. And those who are interested can, can now pick it up. It is available in hard copy. Uh, but it was, I was interested in knowing what happened at this time. Why do these women, the wives of Akbar, uh, become much less visible to us? You know, we know a lot less about them at this time. And they become, in fact, I think Shah Jahan says that from this time onwards it was determined that they were to be pardegyan they were to be invisible they were behind the curtain now firmly and uh, you know we are not allowed to see them directly their names are hidden behind great titles uh, and their humanity their individuality is completely hidden from us of course this was a time that abu al fazl starts uh, you know writing about them and when he writes about them they are always chaste they're always kapolas of chastity and pillars of chastity so we cannot see any individuality in these women anymore and uh, for the first time, these structures are built for them, stone structures at Fatehpur Sikri. The Zanana Mahal becomes a concrete reality for the first time. And these women are meant to be staying chastely and invisibly in these uh, Mahals. Now, what happened at this time that could explain some of these things um, was something of a mystery uh, and something that interested me. Of course, it is at this time that Akbar, in fact, meets the Rajputs uh, you know, of his empire. He marries into some of the great families of the Rajputs, and they integrate Raj, uh, the Mughal harem. Um, now, polygamy had become rampant. Already, even among the elite Rajput clans, uh, marriages were used to bind another clan's loyalty to yourself. So in addition to the Bhai Beta structures that the Rajput clans had, came an ad additional Sagai network, you know. And so now there were large numbers of women in the Rajput Zananas, and it became a problem. Parda became very strict because the, the notion of chastity and Mughal, uh, sorry, Rajput honor became embodied in the chastity of these women and became very important to keep them physically cloistered and safe. And so here you have an image of the Mehrangar uh, Zanana Mahal, and you can see how these high walls and small windows came up to protect uh, the chastity of the women. And this is something that may have been then brought. For, uh, in this miniature, we see um, Johar being carried out during the siege of Chittor, the three separate huge fires that were uh, that were lit to uh, to um, kill about 300 women of the Rajput clans. Um, and this was something that happened before the Mughals came to Hindustan. Uh, Rima Huja, who writes, uh, uh, you know, a magisterial um, history of Rajasthan, tells us about um, Rajput clans that committed uh, Sati and Johar even in the face of other Rajput clans when their uh, uh, when their autonomy was challenged. Uh, so this was a reality of uh, elite Rajput life by this time. And this also came into the Mughal uh, Zanana when Akbar married uh, his Rajput wives. And here we have a miniature uh, painted a little later, but it depicts uh, the, the time when Akbar's 
first Rajput wife, Harka by Kachwaha of Amir. She gives birth to Salim, who later becomes Jahangir. So this is a very uh, beautiful and important miniature because it shows some of the very influential women of that time. The woman seated on a chair uh, is, is, Bega Beg uh, sorry, is Hamida Banu Begum, the mother-in-law of the woman who has just given birth. Uh, and seated across from her is possibly Bega Begum, uh, come from Delhi to attend to the birth. Um, and you have all these other Rajput and Timurid women uh, standing around. And Harka by herself, the mother, is presented almost in a, here if you can look at her a little more clearly, it is almost in a Jaroka Darshan sort of manner um, in which you have her presented to the viewer. Um, and these are all the very important women of that time. And of course, Harkabai, when she joins the harem, she's allowed to retain her, uh, her religion. She brings with her her entire entourage. Uh, the Zenana Dori from the, uh, from the Rajput houses was sent with their, with their brides when they married into other families. So she brought a, an entire microcosm of Rajput life when she joined the Mughal harem. You know, there were masseuse, there were dancers, there were cooks, there were chefs, there were all sorts of uh, women who came with her and who brought this Rajasthani culture, which came into the Zenana at this time, the Mughal Zenana. But unfortunately, instead of understanding uh, the nuances through which uh, you know Rajput uh, culture came into the Zenana, these uh, you know ladies were mythologized and uh, through Mughalism, Joda Akbar, and many other ways. And because uh, you know. Uh, it is tempting to think of them in this sort of romantic manner. Uh, these images were transmitted, became very popular, and we tend to reduce them to these objects of love, uh, and we forget the, the intricate ways in which they were able to have influence. For example, uh, Maryam Zamani, uh, who is Harka Bai, who in fact was a very influential woman, especially later on when her son becomes Emperor Jahangir. Um, she had trade ships, she had a lot of money, she traded in indigo. Uh, we forget all about this and since she's called Maryam Uzzamani, people start saying, oh, this was Akbar's Christian wife because of the name Maryam coming from Mary. You know, So we forget that actually Mary is a very uh, respected and honored figure in Islam too and that this is a absolutely acceptable Islamic title for um, uh, you know, uh, a Mughal Pacha's mother, Maryam Uzzamani. And now if you go and visit her tomb outside uh, Fatehpur Sikri, they will tell you that this is Akbar's Christian wife. So this is how the memory of women is a very fragile thing and very easily becomes manipulated and uh, obscured. Uh, in this interesting um, miniature, you see a lot of details. This is the this shows the birth of another prince, Murad, brother of Salim, and you can see women involved in all sorts of different ways during the birth of a child. So you see in the top right corner how they are attending to the mother, how they. Uh, they are cooking special foods for her, how they're looking after her. In the middle section, you can see how they are beginning to distribute gifts, how they are, you know, uh, playing music and celebrating amongst each other. Uh, I think one of them is, in fact, um, putting colored, perfumed water on another, on the lady playing the dholak. So you can see the many ways in which they're involved in the celebration of this child's birth. What is interesting during uh, Akbar's time is that uh, even though they may not be written about, you sometimes see women in the miniatures in different ways. So here you see, this is a detail of the construction, a construction project during Akbar's time. And you can see the women in the upper left, uh, pretty timeless images of women even today involved in construction work. Um, and this other one here on the left, again, more women involved in construction work. And somehow you can see that their faces, uh, these uh, you know lower class women, they are shown with more individuality than some of the upper caste women, upper class women who are shown in the typical you know beautiful woman sort of uh, mode. Whereas these women are shown with uh, somehow I find a little more empathy and compassion. Now, another famous woman whom I have not spoken about a great deal in my book uh, is Noor Jahan. And the reason I haven't spoken about her uh, was because I wanted to bring out the voices of the women that we have forgotten to a much greater extent. Noor Jahan tends to be remembered a lot more. And there, are lot, there is a great deal more writing, accessible writing on Noor Jahan. Uh, and also, she is not a Timurid woman. Um, I was more interested in studying the legacy of Timurid, uh, Timurid women themselves. Um, but Ruby Lal has uh, written an extraordinary book, a biography of um, Noor Jahan, and just two two images from Noor, from Ruby's book. Um, 
Now, when we think of history in a sort of bullet point way, which is often the way in which we are taught history, it doesn't make a great deal of sense to us. You know, we are told certain things about somebody and then we move on to somebody else and we don't understand the context of these things and we do not understand, therefore, the significance and the power of these things. So when we are said that, uh, when we are told that Noor Jahan used to appear at the Jaroka window uh, and that she had, was, uh, you know, she used to shoot muskets and shoot tigers with them, you know, we think of them in isolation it doesn't mean a great deal, but these are all symbols of sovereignty. So if we put them together, like Ruby Lal has explained, um, you know, uh, and we see that in fact she was ruling as co-sovereign. She had uh, the same sort of power as Jahangir did, and they were ruling together. What I have talked about in my book is this extraordinary monument, the Itmat ud uh, and Asmat Begum's tomb that Jah uh, Noor Jahan builds for her parents. And it is such a beautiful uh, and extraordinary piece of work before the Taj Mahal was born. This is the first structure built of pure white marble with inlay work in this manner, uh, which of course is what is used in the Taj Mahal and which we remember uh, you know, so much better than um, Noor Jahan's legacy. But her legacy is extremely important and vital because I believe one of the reasons she was so crucial to Jahangir, why she was able to command the respect that she did, was that her aesthetic vision was also completely aligned to, um, to Jahangir's great aesthetic vision. And, and therefore, this reinforced in his mind, you know, the power that she was able to command. Now we come to the last phase, uh, the phase of the daughters. Now, by this time, by this time of, say, Jah Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb, the Mughal Empire has grown to a great extent. It has become very, very wealthy. And therefore, these women have become um, uh, extremely wealthy themselves as well. So this, is, this shows us a different sort of woman, uh, exemplified for me, uh, you know, in its best form by Jahanara Begum, daughter of Shah Jahan. Now, there's also Roshnara Begum, whom I don't have the time to talk about, but in my book, I do. So these uh, daughters become extremely powerful, wealthy, and influential. Over here, she is, uh, Jahanara is shown um, with a manuscript in her hand, you know, probably um, pointing to the fact that she was a respected, educated, and erudite woman. She was also an extremely wealthy woman who firstly organized the weddings of her brothers upon the death of her mother, Mumtaz Mahal. Uh, the, wedding, the wedding of Dara Shikho showed here um, was said to be the most expensive wedding organized in the world at the time. She also had a ship called the Sahabi. Now, she herself was called Begum Sahib. So a lot of her structures and her uh, the things she commanded bore her name. This, so this was called the Sahibi. Now, this is not an exact uh, image of her particular ship. It is a, it is a ship of, the, of that, that period, the 17th century. So um, she owned this amazing, huge ship, which carried out trade in her name and made her an even more wealthy person than she already was. She commanded the entire revenue of Surat. Uh, at that time, in addition to six additional villages, adding to her great wealth. And the Europeans who came to court at this time were entirely amazed by the great wealth uh, and the great trade activities that she carried out. And they could not, you know, it, it frustrated them. They could not understand it because women, uh, corresponding women, uh, you know, in England at this time were not allowed to, uh, to, to, to to um, use wealth independently. They had to hand it over to their husbands. Uh, so the Europeans explained it by using all sorts of very degrading terms. And they accused Jahanara of committing incest with her father, Shah Jahan. And for them, this is what explained her great, uh, her great influence over her father. Now, Jahanara, interestingly, didn't just, you know, stop at things like, uh, you know, the great celebrations and the trade that she conducted. She also thought of herself as a, as a Sufi princess, um, along with, she was extremely close to her brother, Dara Shiko, and the two of them carried out almost a parallel journey, uh, you know, in the Sufi uh, uh, tradition. And um, in fact, Supriya Gandhi's new book on Dara Shuko uh, outlines this very clearly. And she, has, she also says that this a journey of Jahanara was conducted almost parallel to Dara Shiko. It was, you know, practically the same journey. So she goes and becomes a disciple uh, of Mullah Shah Badakshi in Kashmir. Um, and she... <clears throat> 
uh, you know, has the same, uh, you know, blessings from him. She has the same, uh, you know, spiritual visions uh, that Darashiko also says she ha he has. And she, because uh, of the power of these, uh, the spiritual journey, Jahanara writes two books uh, at this time, which are, again, an extremely rare thing, uh, you know, for a woman to be doing, uh, you know, at this time, especially a Muslim woman. Um, and some of the things she writes in her biography, especially, are very interesting to, to read. And she says that when a woman becomes a man in the path to God, she is a man. And one cannot anymore call her a woman. Whoever is honored by the greatest happiness of knowing and realization is the perfect human or the absolute essence of the world and is superior among all living creatures, whether man or woman. So I was very interested to see the scope of Jahanara's ambition, something that we forget today. You know, we come back to Darashiko and we study his works. And of course, he carried out many other additional works. But this Sufi journey that Darashiko carried out, Jahanara also carried it out. And she also wrote biographies, you know, attesting to this great journey that she carried out. Now, uh, I just wanted to show you this, uh, this image, this map of Shah Jahanabad, uh, Red Fort today, um, uh, Old Delhi, sorry, uh, to show that the women at this time were also uh, involved in a, in a very interesting enterprise, which is that when Shah Jahan started the building of Shah Jahanabad and he built the Red Fort and he built Jama Masjid and the walls, the rest of the buildings uh, he handed over to the care of his noblemen, his wives and daughters, and they took over the building of the other great structures. And what is interesting to note is that all the other Orange dots that you can see were built by other daughters and wives of Shah Jahan, you know, Akbari Bedi, uh, Akbari uh, Begum, uh, Fatehpuri Begum, and many other wives, and Roshnara Begum in addition. But the structures in green were all built by Jahanara Begum. She built the Karavansarai in the, in the middle there, which is today the town hall. She built the, the Chamni Chowk, in fact, area the, uh, uh, in the center and the hammams, uh, which were and all these buildings were destroyed after 1857. Um, but I wanted to show you the great scope of her ambition when we look at the area encompassed by this green, uh, you know, this great swathe of green buildings. Uh, and that little bit of green there in the Red Fort was her own mansion, which she built uh, apparently according to her own designs. Now, uh, Jahanara Begum uh, decided to be buried in a very important site next to Nizamuddin Olya's tomb itself um, in the Nizamuddin Olya Darga area. Um, for me, this was a very interesting thing. Again, it comes back to her Sufi persona that after this life she has led, this life of great wealth and extravagance and ambition, uh, in the end, when it comes to the end of her life, she, cho she chooses such a holy spot and a spot which, you know, which other princes and other important men jostle to be buried uh, next to such an important site. And she is the only, at that time, she was the only woman to be buried in this holy precinct. And if you look at these buildings, now from Google Maps, I took this image just to show to you that may, if you look at this, uh, the center, uh, this bottom right is where Jahanara Begum is buried, right uh, next to Nizamuddin Olya's tomb. But, you know, radiating out from this holy area are all these other uh, interesting monuments built by women or influenced by women in some way, uh, which are also so close to this area. So we, there's Kherul Manasal Mahamanga's uh, Madrasa complex. Um, there's Atka Khan's tomb, which is where Gigi Anga is buried. There's Humayu's tomb next to which uh, um, Bega Begum lived all her life. Uh, Abdul Rahim also has Gigi Anga's daughter because um, he was married to her. So all these important women, you know, through the centuries have something to do with structures so close to this holy spot, which was such a powerful spot, really. And, uh, you know, we tend to forget about this and it is only when we put all these clues together that we get some idea of how important and influential they really were. Now to finish, just one last slide to finish this talk with uh, and then we we come almost full circle in a way uh, with Zebu Nissa who was Aurangzeb's daughter uh, and she was a very accomplished poet, an erudite woman, a precocious woman who learned uh, you know, the Quran very early on. Um, 
but in a in a sense this all came to naught because uh, aurangzeb's rule lasted for so long at some point zebun nisa supported one of her brothers because it seemed like surely aurangzeb uh, you know would not last much longer but he did and so uh, zebun nisa was caught giving support to uh, you know aurangzeb's rival his son and she was put in salimgarh prison uh so and for the last 20 years of her life she remained this prisoner in salimgarh prison and even the title she chose for writing some of her her poetry to said she was a fine poet is makfi the hidden one uh so for me this really symbolized sort of the end of the influence of these great women spanning from the time of the matriarchs who were so openly influential who could travel so freely coming down to this last uh woman of the timurids uh, who had to be you know hidden and imprisoned uh, Uh, because of the way in which she tried to exercise her power and in which it was no longer possible now uh, you know in the in the early 18th century to exercise that power anymore and so zebun nisa uh, is the woman that i finish uh, my book with and also uh, this talk with and uh, thank you for joining me here today uh, and thank you for listening to the voices of these daughters of the sun I think uh, thank you very much ma'am for this beautiful presentation and this lecture. Uh, it was really interesting and very engaging. Thank you Ishan. So I think we can move to the question and answer session. By the way the book Akbar the Great Mughal is now available on Amazon. <laughs> so viewers know the drill they can order it from Correct. Amazon. Uh, can you see the question on the Do screen? Do you want me to um, take these questions, Ishan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, what do we know about? So, the first question is. What do we know about the status of women? What do we know about the status of women? Yeah. Yeah. um you know the only woman from the sultanates uh, that i know about that i wrote in an earlier book about uh, is uh, razia sultan so she was uh, you know again an extremely um, influential powerful woman who ruled in her own name who took the title of sultan rather than sultana who was very aware of the gender issue and how uh, you know they tried to uh, minimize her power because of her gender um so she's the only one that i i know about of that period um and in the deccan also i mean this is not an area that uh, you know i have studied so i can't speak with much authority about that did mughal women keep records and diaries you know diary keeping uh, at that time was not uh, a very uh, common thing among hindu hindustani men and women it was quite a rare thing for people to keep uh, diaries um the, the little bit of writing that i have uh, that that i came across i have used so uh, obviously gulbadan's writing and jahanara's writing so these were the two women who were extraordinary in their writing then you have zebu Ze nisa's uh, you know poetry um but in terms of records and diaries we have, we don't have much more than this in addition there are the farmans so as i said you know it is more a question more a task of joining these pieces these puzzle pieces together to get an entire picture than to have one, you know a proper diary format that uh, that one could could follow if we compare the contemporary european royal women and mughal women who do you think enjoyed more liberty um that's a very good question actually and um 
to answer that, you know, I saw the writings uh, of Lady uh, Montague, I think. It was the British ambassador to the Ottomans. So his wife uh, wrote about these Ottoman women, and she was very admiring of their education. And she said, they are so well educated. Uh, and this is something that we don't have, uh, you know, in Europe, in England. So uh, similarly, the Mughal women were highly educated, as you can see you know, from what uh, uh, the little bit I have spoken about. They were able to, when it was necessary for them to, they could record uh, biographies and they could write, uh, you know, poetry. So they were highly educated women, something with which the, their sisters in Europe were not at this time. And they were at least the royal women. We're only talking about royal women. You know, so the royal women were able to, in many cases, command their own wealth and dispose of it in the ways they wanted to, such as in you know in commissioning buildings. In Jahanara, uh, you know, built a mosque uh, in Kashmir for her, her Sufi sheikh. She built uh, a, in Agra a mosque. Um, so they were able to commission buildings in their own names, like uh, even Mahamanga did. Um, they were conducting trade to their own ships. Three independent women conducted trade and had their own ships. So I think, uh, at least where the royal women were concerned, I think possibly the Mughal women had the upper hand at this time. Can you share something about Babur's wives? What was their status? Um, now, Babur is one of the Mughals. Now, we, you know, he's written uh, his own biography. That's an extraordinary document. Um, but Babur was one of the uh, men of the Mughal Empire who I think enjoyed the company of his noblemen rather than his wives. He doesn't write a great deal about his wives in his own biography. Um, but we do hear about them through Gulbadan. And Gulbadan writes especially about one woman, Maham Begum, who was the mother of Humayun, who was favored by uh, by Babur. And when he, you know, when she comes to, I think, Hindustan after a period of perhaps two years, uh, and Babur hasn't seen her for such a long time, and he hears, um, uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, men come running in to tell him that the great caravan has arrived from Kabul and Babur goes running out on foot and he doesn't even take a horse. He goes running all the way to, to meet Maham Begum. Uh, so in Gulbadan's work, we again see these little, uh, you know, signs, even though Babur himself did not write about his wives to, to, to much of an extent, we see through his daughter's writing that he was actually a very fond husband and father. How far did Mughal women have interactions with European travelers like Bernier and Tavani? Uh, what was their perspective of Mughal? What was their perspective of Mughal women? Um, so these women obviously could not have a direct uh, contact with with these European men. There was no way, you know, as it is, they were uh, not really. Uh, able to be openly seen by men, never mind foreign men, you know, so there was an additional barrier where foreign men were, were concerned. So there was no direct interaction, but they had interaction through their agents because they carried out trade with these men. These men, after all, why did they come to court? They, they came seeking trade rights, trading rights. So they found, uh, these men found to their horror that sometimes they had to deal with the with the women like Nur Jahan and Janara, uh, because these were the powerful women who were carrying out trade. So they may not have interacted directly with these men, but they would send their agents uh, who would then talk to the men, uh, you know, figure out terms with them, figure out what product to sell and to buy. Uh, and so they had this sort of indirect um uh, a connection with the men who then wooed them by sending presents, all kinds of luxurious items to try and, uh, you know, uh, make these women more amenable to their cause. Uh, and the men, these European men, were definitely, as I said in the talk, uh, very intrigued by these women. They could not explain the way in which they had so much influence. So they would explain it by, you know, lurid stories of incest, of inappropriate behavior, and, uh, you know, they... Uh, they wrote about Jahanara and Roshnara having many, many lovers and these lovers being uh, burnt alive in, in vats of uh, boiling water by their father when he found out about it. But obviously, all of this was based on bazaar gossip and based on the fact that they could not explain why these women had so much power and influence. Thank you for the session. If it's not too much trouble, says Robin Thomas, could you 
please briefly explain the process you follow <laughs> while conducting research before starting to write a book. So that, uh, you know, uh, Robin would be an entire talk on its own. Uh, it is a very long and tedious uh, process. So the first uh, thing to do is to find as much primary material as possible, you know, uh, writings of that particular period. Um, and um, then to compare it later on with later writings, to find scholarly writings, because scholars have interpreted these writings in so many ways. Uh, so then to come to the scholarly writing, in addition to look at things like, uh, you know, uh, folk tales, um, perhaps uh, in very popular myths, like for Akbar, I looked at the Akbar Birbal myths, at the Jodha Akbar myths, what does it mean? What is the truth behind it? Uh, and to look at architecture, women, uh, you know, built a great deal, you know, a great deal more than we think. So to look at the at this architecture, what did it symbolize? What did they try and accomplish through these buildings? Um, and of course, whenever the women have written, then that is an extremely important source of knowledge is the women's writings themselves, the fermans that they may have, uh, you know, had in their own names, their seals, and then miniature paintings. Um, for me, uh, you know, miniature painting has been a very, very uh, important source of, of uh, primary material to back up the, the findings that I have made through my other research. So it is a long and tedious pro process to filter through all these different sources, uh, you know, and then along the way, come up with some interesting ways in which to get these ideas across because I'm a writer of narrative uh, nonfiction. So I'm writing primarily for a lay audience, you know, not an academic audience. So I need to make all this very heavy information accessible and entertaining at the same time. So as I go along, I, I think in terms of images of scenes that will grab the reader's attention and, and ways in which I can get this across. It's time for two last questions. Uh, well, uh, Shubra Sinha asks, was the system of Parda and Zanana strictly followed at the Mughal royal household? Uh, well, Shubra, as uh, you know, I've tried to show um, in the time of the earlier women, uh, the, the women who came with uh, Babur and Humayun especially, and uh, even the, the women in Akbar's life, especially the matriarchs who lived a long time into his uh, career, they were not invisible in the way we think them. You know, they traveled with the court. They were very lightly veiled. Uh, their influence was always, you know, they, it's very dif difficult, like Ruby Lal has said, to very carefully uh, uh, separate the public and private. There was no such concept of a public and private that was separate. They participated in this life, which was both public and private, and they, uh, you know, uh, were a, a part of the decision-making process, if you like. They gave their own points of view. Their points of view were very relevant. Uh, so there was no, um, uh, you know, invisibility in the way that we assume it to be. This invisibility, this parda, became more opaque later on in the later Mughals. So especially, you know, the princesses like Jahanara and Roshanara. But yet, despite the fact that they were publicly invisible to us, they were still able, uh, you know, to make their presence felt in such a strong way, especially for someone like uh, uh, Jahanara and Roshanara. We see the influence if we you know, if we put it all together, if we patch it all together, then then this is an extremely powerful woman that we're talking about, despite the fact that she was uh, strictly in Parda. Uh, Diksha Chaudhary says, can you please share how to understand in, and interpret the Mughal paintings? Um, you know, the best way to do this uh, is to read up the works of art historians. Uh, you know, luckily, in the past couple of decades, some amazing work has been done by art historians. Uh, and you can follow their works. For example, uh, Dr. Kavita Singh at JNU over here, she has written an amazing book, um, uh, Real Birth in, in Imagined Gardens, for example. These are very accessible works, easy to understand. The methodology is clearly laid out. Um, you know, there, there are many, many uh, you know, famous, well-known and um, uh, accessible art historians who are writing articles and books that can be even read and understood by a lay audience to make sense. And they are particularly writing 
to make people understand how important miniatures were and that there is not one single simple way in which to look at these miniatures. There are many levels of complexity. So you can uh, you know, access this material quite easily now. Thank you, Ishan. Thanks for having me. Good luck for all your future sessions.